So I'm sure most people are probably familiar with uh, The Wizard of Oz, just the, the, the musical or the play. Is it a musical? I don't know. The, the TV show. The movie. It's, it's called a movie. Um, but if you ever read the book uh, by L. Frank Baum that it's based off of, it's there's a, there's a depth to that book that uh, uh, the musical or the movie is is good on its own. But there's a depth to this book that, in fact, there, there's there's a poignant scene. You, you, with, what I mean by that is we think of like the the scarecrow or the Tin Woodsman and you know, the Cowardly Lion, and there's kind of like these characters or caricatures in the movie. But if you read the book, they they all have backstories. In fact, the the backstory of the Tin Woodsman is is remarkable. He wasn't always a Tin Woodsman. He just was a woodsman at one point. He actually tells the story about how he got all you know rusted and needed the oil can in the middle of the woods. And he's he tells the story how he began as a woodsman and he was in love. And uh, he was in love with this munchkin maiden. And, and so he set to work and he set to work so that he could marry her. That was the whole point that he would go into the woods every day because he had this love for her in his heart. But there was the Wicked Witch who didn't want the munchkin maiden to marry the Tin Woodsman. And so she cast a spell on his ax. And as he was chopping away, it slipped and he cut off his leg. And so he went to a, a, like a smithy, someone who worked in metal and built him a new leg. And so he went back to work and then he cut off the next leg and he went to this, the person who made a tin leg for him and he, he went back to work. And then uh, as he tells the story, it's kind of funny because he cut off an arm, cut off, uh, cut off a, uh, the other arm. Uh, at one point he says, actually split himself down the middle. And, and Frank Baum writes the book, he says, and then I thought I was a goner for sure. <laughs> like when he cuts himself in half. But the, tin, the, 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 the smithy, the, the person working in tin was able to put him back together. He says, unfortunately, when he put me together, he made a chest for me, he, he left out the heart. And so I kept working, kept chopping wood, but I no longer had a heart, and so I no longer had any love for the munchkin maiden for whom he had lived his life. So he said, so I'm going to go to the, the wizard, and I'm going to ask for a heart, because that's what I need. You know, the scarecrow says something along the lines of, listen, that's right. I need a brain though, because uh, what good is a heart without a brain? Which is a good point. But then the Tin Woodsman says, that's a good point. He says, all the same, I'm going to ask for a heart. Because without a heart, you can't love. And love is the best thing in the world. Today is the Feast of Corpus Christi. It's the Feast of the Body and Blood of Jesus. It is the sign, I would say, the sign of God's love for the world. I mean, think about John 3.16. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. We could continue that and say, and the Son so loved the world that he gave his very body and blood. You know, uh, Mother Teresa, way back in the day, she... At one point she said, you know, when you look at the crucifix, you can see how much God loved you back then. You look at any, gaze upon any crucifix, you can see that's, that's an image of the love of God. You can see how much Jesus loved you back then. She said, but when you look at the Eucharist, you can see how much Jesus loves you right now. The Eucharist is the love of God for the world in so, so many re really unique ways. Um, I, I, before my mom died, she, she was the master of uh, email forwards. And that's basically at, at her funeral, I made a joke about the fact that probably everyone in this, you know, packed church is beautiful, it's really powerful. Um, probably every one of them had something in common. And that wasn't just that they love my mom, it was that they got an email from her. <laughs> that we said we have special seating for those who have ever gotten a individual email from my mom. Because no one, I've never gotten an individual, like, dear Michael, that, that I've never, never, I just got the forwards. Her last email forward was uh, a talk by Monsignor Shea from You Mary and Bismarck. And it was a talk on the Eucharist. And she just had asked, she, all of us, just listen to this. Listen to this man talk. And who's incredible? Monsignor Shea is amazing. And he was talk, giving a talk for the preparation for the Eucharistic revival that's underway, basically. It's, it's, it's beginning. It's ongoing. It's a whole thing. I don't know when it exactly starts. But I know next summer is going to be a really important season for this Eucharistic revival. Anyways, Monsignor Shea is giving this talk. And one of the things he said is he said that in preparation for that talk that my mom had sent to us, uh, he said, 
a lot of people wrote to me knowing that I was gonna give a talk on the Eucharist. And they said, listen, you need to tell your brother priests, you need to tell the bishops that they need to start talking about the Eucharist and that the Eucharist is truly the real presence of Jesus. That it really is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And, and Monsieur Shea said, as if like my you know knucklehead priests and bishops, they don't already do that. Like as if they're too dense or too dumb or too faithless, they actually do that. He said the reality probably is that most priests do preach about the Eucharist. Most bishops do clearly teach about how the Eucharist at every single Mass, it truly is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. The question is, do we hear? Not just do we hear the words, but are we listening? Is it actually the kind of thing that actually changed our lives? Because I, I think about myself, and I've told the story a thousand times, I don't need to go into it, but when I was about 16, I remember coming upon this teaching about how Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. I was reading a book that my mom had, and I just remember running downstairs into the kitchen, and like, you guys, do you know that Jesus, that's really Jesus in the Eucharist? And my brothers and sisters are like, yeah. I'm like, no, no, it's really, really him. They're like, yeah, moron, we went to Catholic school too. And I went to Catholic school, I went to Mass every single Sunday, I don't know, why? I'm sure someone said it. I'm sure that everyone said it. I'm sure every person, every teacher ever told me that really is Jesus. And I just didn't make a difference. So here's Monsignor Shea saying, you just need me to tell you this thing. You don't need me just to tell you this. What we need to do is we need to pray for a miracle because we realize whenever there's a conversion, that's always a miracle. Whenever someone opens themselves up to a truth of the faith, that's always a miracle. And in particular, the miracle of Jesus truly present in the Eucharist. To be able to be convicted by this, I, I, I'm convinced that when someone is convicted by this truth, regardless of what obstacles they'll ever face in their life, regardless of how many fails and how many sins, how much of a shipwreck they can make of their life, they will know there's no other place for them in the world. This, that is part of my story as well. I was so convicted by Jesus' truly presence in the Eucharist that I was like, hey, this, I want to give my whole life, I want to study this, I want to learn more. I went to a college and by, I've told this story too, I don't mean to <laughs> beat a dead horse. If I went to this college, went to a Catholic school and uh, by the time I graduated, I was going to Mass every single day because that's the, Jesus in the Eucharist. I was a missionary at a Catholic mission and I hated the Catholic Church. But I wasn't going to leave because, well, the Eucharist. So I was one of those kind of like, you know, I guess you might say cafeteria type Catholic, where I was like, no, the Eucharist is true. The other stuff is optional. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for that because I would have run away. I would have walked away if it hadn't been this deep abiding conviction that this is truly Jesus in the Eucharist. And if it's not, this is the remarkable thing. If it's not, then what are we doing? Not just we're wasting our time. If this is not Jesus, it's not like we're wasting our time. I mean, think about going back to the, I, I, Robert Bellman, he was a saint at the time of the Reformation. He was one of the counter-reformers, basically. So uh, Martin Luther and some others had pointed out real corruption in the church. They pointed out real brokenness in the church. And so it wasn't like the church was like, no, we're fine. The many in the church were like, yes, you're right. There is real brokenness. There is real corruption. Robert Bellman was one of these guys. And at the same time, his solution wasn't to abandon the church. His solution was to be converted himself and then to help other people be converted. His solution wasn't leave the church. His solution was lead the church in conversion. And so Robert, Robert Bellman is having this debate, right, with a, a Protestant reformer who's uh, basically denying Jesus' presence in the Eucharist. And he's saying, this is not his body. This is merely a symbol. And Robert Bellman is kind of a jokester. At one point, he got up and he said, okay, let me sum up your argument. Your argument is, this is not Jesus' body. He says, but in the Gospels, Jesus says very clearly, this is my body. So he said, you're saying this is not his body. Jesus said, this is my body. If you were me, who do you think I should believe? Because this is what comes down to. It comes down to like, this is Jesus or it's not. It either is at every Mass, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, or it's not. And the stakes are not, again, like we're, wasting, we're just wasting our time if it's not. The stakes are higher. We, we run a camp every summer with our junior high students and high school students work there, college students and adults. We all work together. It's, it's an incredible couple of weeks. It's not a Catholic camp. The camp we put on is Catholic, but the grounds are, are not. They belong to another uh, Christian denomination. And at one point, the, the director of the camp, he came up to me and said, yeah, you know, Father, uh, uh, the board of directors, we had a meeting and, and they're really concerned that uh, we host Catholics on, at our camp. It's like, oh, how come? And he said, well, because one, one of the members of the board stood up and said, uh, you know, that, that they believe, those Catholics believe that at every mass, that really is Jesus. They, they worship bread and wine as if that is God. They're, they're committing idolatry on our campground, like uh, in our facility. Do we really want people to commit idolatry 
in our buildings, uh, at our camp. And he was like, ah, and I told him, like, no, it's not that big of a deal. And I, actually, I looked at him. I was like, mm, he's actually correct. <laughs> like, that, those are the stakes. You're right. He's right. That what we do, if it's not really Jesus, then we are the worst idolaters in the history of humanity. Because at every Mass, what happens? Every Mass, not only does the priest say, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world, but when you come forward to receive Holy Communion, the priest or the extraordinary minister of Holy Communion raises that host aloft and says, the body of Christ, and you and I, we say amen, which doesn't just mean uh-huh or thanks. It means essentially. Well, it means I believe it is so. Ultimately, though, it means I stake my life on that. Every time you and I approach our Lord in the Eucharist, and we hear the body of Christ or the blood of Christ, and we say amen, what we're saying is, I stake my life on that being Jesus. And if it's not Jesus, then I'm literally condemning myself because I'm committing idolatry. I'm committing one of the gravest, worst sins that's prohibited all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, but it's at the heart of everything we do. Because the Eucharist is the heart of everything we do. The Eucharist is the heart of everything we do. You know, I've, I've, I've heard it said that, that all the sacraments are, are the action of Jesus. All the sacraments are the work of Jesus in this world. I mean, so whenever we go to confession, that's the work of Jesus. That's the action of God's mercy. When we have anointing of the sick, that, that's God's work of healing. When we get confirmed, that's God's, that's Jesus. It's that work of Jesus sending his Holy Spirit upon us. Like every sacrament is the work of Jesus, is the action of Jesus. But the Eucharist, the Mass, isn't merely the work of Jesus. It is Jesus. See, every other sacrament is a something. The Eucharist is a someone. Yes, it is the work of Jesus in the sense that it's, it's his, himself offering his, himself to the Father and the power of the Holy Spirit. But the Eucharist is Jesus. Every other sacrament is a something. The Eucharist is a someone. It is the God who is love. And love's the best thing in the world. And still, it's, it's one of those moments where we still come to the Mass and we're like, yeah, but I don't, I don't feel the love. Like, I, I come to Mass and I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention, I'm, I'm praying, I'm distracted by all the things going on outside of me, inside of me, and I'm trying, I'm trying to give the Lord my heart. But I feel like I don't get anything back. I, under, I don't understand that. But we know we do, right? Like, we know we do get something back. We don't get, just get something back, we get someone back. We get him, himself. It's hard because he's hidden. It's hard because it's really Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity, but under a disguise, right? It's under the accidents of what looks and feels and tastes and smells like bread and wine. But there are some times when Jesus pulls back the veil. There are some times when God himself has said, okay, I want you to know that this really is me. I want you to know that this really is my love. I want you to know that this really is my love for you, my heart for you. It's happened a number of times. I just want to talk about two times briefly. In like the 700s, there was a priest in a town called Lanciano, Italy. Maybe you've heard of this. In Lanciano, Italy, there was a priest who was celebrating Mass and he, he wasn't he was struggling with the idea of transubstantiation. He was struggling with the idea that this bread in his, his hands, as he was saying, this is my body, the wine in the chalice, this is my blood, that it was really, really Jesus. And as he pronounced those words in Latin, this is my body, this is my blood, in his very hands, the bread didn't just transubstantiate, it transformed into flesh in his hands. And the wine didn't just transubstantiate, but it transformed into blood in the chalice. This was 1,300 years ago. They, the, immediately, of course, they stopped the Mass. And they, If you go to Lanciano, you can see where they have preserved the Eucharist in a reliquary, essentially. It's, it's above the altar, and it's, uh, it's inc incredible. In the 1970s, 1980s, they actually allowed scientists to examine a sample of this Eucharist that had been transformed 1,300 years ago. And the scientists, as they looked at this, they discovered a number of things. They discovered this is true human flesh, and this is true human blood. 
They discovered that the blood was, and the type of the blood was AB, which is the universal receiver. They found some other things as well. But I want to add that story in the 1700s and the 1990s, or 1980s, to a miracle that happened in Buenos Aires, Argentina. I think, I don't remember the date exactly, I think it was September or August of 1996, that uh, there was a host that was discarded. It was left on the ground or left on a, the candle. And so someone found it, gave it to the priest, they didn't consume it, they put it in some water and put it in the, in the tabernacle uh, for a week. And after a week, it hadn't dissolved, because that's what normally do. You just let it dissolve, and then it ceases to become the Eucharist, because it's no longer bread. It's no longer anything. Then you can dispose of this. But after a week, it didn't dissolve. In fact, after a week, there started to have, like, blood that was coming out of the host. And so the priest took it to his bishop, and the bishop said, okay, let's hold on to this for another month. And then another couple of years, they took care of this host in distilled water for three years. In 1999, they sent a sample of this host to a doctor at Columbia University in New York. They didn't tell him where it came from. I said, just examine this and tell us what you see. And, and the doctor was like, okay, well, here's what I found. I, I found that, um, yes, this is the blood type is AB. It's the same blood type. This is real human blood. This is real human flesh. But they also found the same thing that they found in Lanciano. It wasn't just flesh from any part of the human person, of the human body. It wasn't like just like skin, it wasn't just from a leg. It was flesh from a human heart. In fact, it was from the inside wall of the left ventricle of the myocardia. They found that the, uh, the doctor said this, the heart muscle was inflamed and it contains a large number of white blood cells. In fact, the thing that was confused him the most about all this stuff is that uh, the white blood cells were still alive. You typically, white blood cells are dead within minutes or hours after the person, uh, they're removed from a living body, living tissue. Yet these were, for years, they still had living white blood cells. And as he's looking at examining this tissue, he found that the person whose heart this was, this sample was collected while they're still alive, he said. And the heart was traumatized by someone beating this person, particularly beating him around the, around the chest. Later on, they were told that this sample came from a consecrated host from a Catholic mass. And the doctor in charge said, how and why a consecrated host would change its character and become living human flesh and blood will remain an inexplicable mystery to science, a mystery totally beyond her competence. But upon further reflection, one of the things that is absolutely clear, here is the blood type AB, universal receiver. You know, there, we know this, there is no one for whom Jesus Christ has not died. No one who's ever lived, is living, or will live for whom Jesus Christ doesn't have room in his heart. Universal receiver. Coming from the left ventricle, which is the part of the heart that pumps fresh blood, oxygenated blood, to the rest of the body. It comes from the heart. Because you and I are made for love. And we recognize that every time we come to the Mass, we're receiving the very heart of God. Every time we come to the Mass, we're receiving the very love of God. Every time we come to the Mass, we are receiving from the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and the Son who so loved the world that he gave the world his body and blood and soul and divinity, that at every single Mass, on this feast day of Corpus Christi, we're reminded of this truth. At every single Mass, we receive the very heart of God. At every single Mass, we receive the very love of God. And love is the best thing in the world.